is Andy Hainer. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, or as I affectionately call it, the Socialist Republic of Madison. Um, uh, we've lived there since 2001. Uh, before that, my wife and I uh, were missionaries in Turkey. Um, we had been missionaries also in South Africa. And then I did a year in purgatory as a assist, associate youth minister at the Southern Baptist Church in, uh, in Birmingham, uh, Alabama. Um, great people. I just was not cut out for that sort of uh, hyper-structured uh, environment. It was a very program-driven church, and so some of you probably have had uh, stints in that kind of uh, environment. And so it took me a while to realize that, you know, my call to ministry was uh, it was really to to minister with people and with God, not programs. I'm not an administrator of programs, and that just drove me bananas. Uh, so that's why I call it my year in purgatory. Plus, I came out of a uh, I was saved out of a Roman Catholic background, so I'm well acquainted with purgatory. That was I, my hope of uh, my hope my my greatest hope in life uh, up until the point that I actually got saved was that I would make it into purgatory. <laughs> Hey, you know, I was I was not doing good. My goal was to be 51% good, because <laughs> I thought, you know, at the end of the day, I was gonna I was gonna get my good, and my bad weighed out. And then uh, when I went to college, you know, I lost all hope of ever getting that scale to hit 51% on the good side anymore. Um, but then I could never. Uh, never escaped the fact that I knew that there was a God. I just knew I didn't know the God that was there. And I never met him at church lighting candles, standing up, sitting down, doing the hokey pokey. Um, you know, I, we had some interesting conversations, but nobody was able to answer at that point in time the questions that I had. Uh, until one night I'm coming home from uh, partying and doing some mortal sinning. And um, uh, I'm just unsatisfied with life. I had been really hard charging, doing everything that I knew that was supposed to make me successful and supposed to make me happy. And some people hit rock bottom. My problem is I hit the empty top. You know, I was doing everything that I thought was going to make me happy, but I felt very discontent, very empty inside. Um, and uh, then I was just decided I was going to pray and said, you know, now I pr lay me down to sleep. Lord, if I die, please don't let me wake up in hell kind of prayer. You know, those nice little Catholic prayers you, you learn. And uh, it wasn't exactly that. It was supposed to rhyme and be pretty like a Hallmark card. Um, but I'm starting to pray and I'm like, and then all of a sudden I just had this sense of the presence of God come over me. Um, and the thought is like God hacked my computer. All of a sudden, you know, here I am just, I thought I was just, you know, typing. And then all of a sudden here comes a chat box. Choo! And it had a message in it. Tonight's Friday night, tomorrow night's Saturday night. You have the same thing planned with the same group of people. Who do you think you are fooling? And I realized I was not fooling God, apparently. And so then I started contemplating, you know, what, what, what's, what's wrong? Why, why is my life so empty? And, you know, trying so hard to, you know, to be successful. And I've got everything that I want. I know you're there, but I'm not doing great. And he said... I didn't even know this was a Bible verse until later. Um, what good is it for a man if he gains the whole world and then loses his soul? And I was like, wow, that's, that's my problem. I'm winning the wrong game. And, uh, and so then I started thinking about trying to rectify this and becoming a better person. You know, well, I guess I will try to go back to church and I need to stop cussing and I need to stop running around with girls and I guess I could stop drinking and, you know, some of the vices, you know, eliminating those. And, and then, you know, I'm starting to think that way. And then uh, the verse comes to me. I didn't know it was a verse. If you try to save your life, okay, and then he, thankfully God continues, right? <laughs> but if you want to find life, lose your life, you lose your life for me in the gospel, right? That's what Jesus said. And so I was like, I knew that the, the Good Friday story. I knew Jesus was the you new know, Christmas and Easter and all that stuff. I just didn't know what it had to do with me. I thought Jesus was a martyr, a good, you know, uh, I knew he was the son of God, but, you know, what does that have to do with me? And then I realized that that's exactly the whole deal is that he died for us, he rose again, and that we're not going to find life in ourselves. Faith, true faith, is turning our life in, it's surrendering our life in this world.
to receive a life that outlives our bodies, a life that comes from God, the life that raised Jesus from the dead. Amen? Yes, Amen. So, yes, sir? Still having problems? Is it when the display goes off, is the yeah, off? no, no, it's still, oh, it should, I, yeah. I'm going to turn the display on and record it. Oh, I don't know. Sure. No, yeah, you know what? This said that the uh, recording is stuck. Yeah. Well, no, it's still going. But it's not, uh, whatever. We'll be editing later. Whatever. You know, if it works, it works. We tried, right? I mean, you are my witnesses. We tried. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyway, so at that point, you know, I'm kind of giving you a little bit of ramp up because I always, especially when it comes to healing, people have a lot of skepticism and stuff like that. And that's sort of naturally so. So I just want to kind of give you a little bit of my story. Um, so at that point, I started, um, I got involved with a campus ministry that was kind of like Campus Crusade for Christ and Navigators had a baby. So it had the discipleship emphasis of the Navigators and had the evangelism emphasis of Campus Crusade. So it was a really healthy environment. Um, and so for me, church for a long time was uh, my friends that love Jesus with me and we're pursuing Jesus and growing in him and we're reaching the world for Christ. And so it was just, you know, the, the friends that we're running with. Who's the tribe that you're running with? To me, that's what church is, right? It's not a, a, a building to attend on a Sunday morning. Good grief. That's not what Jesus died for. Jesus died to set us free from life in this world so that we could live in his presence and that we could manifest his presence in this world. Uh, and so we're a new tribe. We're a heaven's tribe. We're God's family. Amen. Uh, and so that being that being true, you know, there's a lot more to it than just a bunch of college kids <laughs> running around. You know, you got you need the cradle to the grave sort of thing. And so I got involved and uh, so I've been trying to figure out how does this all fit at a local level in a you know work a day world where you have. Uh, everything from uh, grandparents down to kids and things like that. Well, I couldn't figure it out quick enough, and so went to seminary and be, went to the mission field. I was like, you know, let's just start from scratch because what I'm seeing, you know, what the times I had to preach at um, at uh, you know big regular churches, I would just see people, you know, they'd come in. And they'd sing their little songs, and they'd sit down, and you'd stand up, and they'd just go into this thousand-yard stare, and then they'd wake up when you're done, and then they'd go out. And it just grieved me because it seemed like Jesus, the life that I had been experiencing was so amazing. Um, you know, why is it that we just sort of fall into this routine of just attending and going passive and going dormant? Um, and so we'll, we'll address some of that stuff because it's been amazing, you know, just to discover the life that and how to live this out together because it's, it's exactly what, uh, what fits the spirit of God that, that lives within us. Well, part of the, the whole campus ministry thing and, and going to seminary and those kind of things, and, and uh, I got involved. I, I, was, I tell everybody I was raised by a pack of Baptists. You know, I was <laughs> born again, kind of an orphan boy out there in the world. And, you know, and the great thing about Baptists is that, man, they taught me a, a, a love for the Word of God. And that is important just not just to uh, to hear somebody else preach it, but to study it for yourself and to get into the word. Uh, and, you know, so that I was very and still am a very vigorous student of the word. And um, but the, the thing that was really crazy for me is that I would read the Bible and I'd see all this miracles and supernatural stuff and everything that I read so many times, you know, you would see stuff like, you know, Jesus would send the disciples out, regular average people, and they would see miracles. And then it seems like this is building momentum, you know, like I'm leaving and, and now everybody's going to do it. You know, whoever believes in me, the works I do, they'll do it also. But, you know, then I would look around and you know, and then then I would talk to my buddies about it, and they would say, "Yeah, that's charismatic stuff. Those are the, you know, those are the weird people." You know, and then you'd watch, and then I'd flip on the television, and you know, the ladies wore too much makeup, and they had silver hair, and the guys spoke with southern accents, and had Rolex watches and white suits, and. I didn't want an emotionally distraught wife that wore too much makeup, and I didn't want a, to wear a white suit. And they were also begging you for money, and that was about the time that the PTL scandal broke out, you know, with all the hypocrisy and stuff like that. And I was like, forget that. Plus, I still have a Catholic military father, mm -hmm. right? And so all of his, 
ah, there's, you know, blah, 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 asking me for my money, and yeah, they can go to hell, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. And so without realizing it, some of that prejudice is, is sort of still latent in there. Uh, and the people that I knew that had godly character, that loved the Word of God, that wanted to follow Jesus and make a difference, um, those people were saying, yeah, you know, I, I really believe God could still do it, but that, you know, that was special for back then. So that just kind of rolls around in there. Well, fast forward a little bit, now I go to Turkey as a missionary. And I thought I was going, this was after seminary, I thought I was going there to change the world and God was taking me there to detox me from seminary. What do I mean by that? You come out with your mind so full of stuff, you think that, man, you know, I know so much. You're so puffed up with all the knowledge. You just can't help it. It's just a natural thing, you know. Uh, you know, it's just like you think what you know is just going to solve everything. Well, the problem with that is there were a couple of things. In seminary, I, I had a goal of studying two main things. I wanted to study for myself and find out what does the Word of God teach about the charismatic phenomena, the signs and wonders and the miracles that we, that we see in the New Testament. And it, does, that, does, it, does the Word of God indicate that these things are temporary or for a select few or something like that? And I studied this out for myself and I, at, at the end of it, and I looked at both sides of the issue and at the end of the day, I fell completely on the side of, you know what? This is for today. This is till Jesus comes back. This is till uh, t this is for everybody. This wasn't just even a select few, and uh, so I was what I called a theological charismatic, which means I was useless <laughs> and frustrated, right? Because I was theologically convinced that these things were right and should be happening, but they weren't happening in my life and I didn't know how to make it work. And so that means I was frustrated and I wasn't seeing what I believed was possible. So that frustration part of it, I think, is kind of like that groan that Jesus had when you know he comes down the mountain and his, uh, this father meets him and says, you know, we brought our boy to your disciples and they couldn't get him healed. And he goes, ah, <laughs> you, you twisted generation looking at his disciples, you know, how long am I going to be with you guys? Bring the boy to me. You know, that kind of, ah, uh, you know, you weren't created for this. Why, you know, why is this so hard for you guys to get? You know, and I'm on the other side of that. Why is this so hard for me, God? Why, you know, I wasn't created for this, you know? But, but part of that frustration is a good thing because the Spirit of God in you knows that God has got so much more for you and that keeps you from settling down and, and just sort of, you know, just deciding, okay, well, I'm just going to suck for the rest of my life. <laughs> and thank God for grace. <laughs> you know, I was there for such a long time, you know. Um, so then uh, so then there came a point where after coming back from Turkey, we came back from Turkey because my wife was having health issues. And it's so frustrating to believe that healing could be happening, should be happening, uh, is legitimate for today. And you to be laying hands on your wife and saying, God, please heal her if it's your will, right? That's where I was at because I believed that, okay, God's sovereign. You know, that was a big deal in my world at that, at that time. And I still believe in the sovereignty of God. I just don't believe in, you know, there's, there's a way. I, I'm just, this week I, I learned some stuff about uh, my camera. I had one of our ministry partners blessed us with some camera equipment that's way too good for me. I don't know anything about it. But I learned about this thing called overexposure. You know what it does? It just like makes every, it takes the, the light in one area and just it gets so bright that you can't really see everything that's there. And I, I think there, for me, I was, I had overexposure to the sovereignty of God. Like it was, it was blinding me to other truth. So it was, there, 
there was so much emphasis. It's kind of like those caricatures, right? If I, you know, you ever go to the fair, you know, and somebody draws your face or whatever, they're going to, you know, they're going to really emphasize your features, your nose, your eyes, your chin, you know, they're going to overemphasize certain things. And so it's, it's not that they're not there. It's just when you overemphasize it, it actually makes a caricature of the real deal instead of the real deal. And so we have to be, be careful as we look at things that, you know, I had a view of the sovereignty of God that when what set me free from it was looking at the way that Jesus approached the sovereignty of God. If anybody believed in the sovereignty of God, it must be Jesus, right? And then if anybody had it rightly exposed so that you're seeing it in pure cinematic view, you know, it had to be him. And yet he never treated sickness and disease the way that those who tr talk about the sovereignty of God do. We attribute sickness and disease to the sovereignty of God. Well, if God wants them healed, they'll be healed in God's time. And, you know, and we talk about sickness and disease that way. It's theological, but it doesn't match Jesus. Jesus always treated sickness and disease like it was the work of the enemy and that because God is sovereign and with me, you can't stay. Yeah. Right? So sovereignty means basically that God is the biggest dude on the block with the biggest gun and nobody can get him off the hill. Yeah. Right? It's, it, it operates by law of the jungle. Not merely by somebody putting a badge on somebody. I mean, how many of you have had have bosses that have been promoted to the level of their incompetency, right? And so they have the label, hey, I'm in charge. Why? Because I've got the experience and because I've got this tag on my door that says I know more than everybody else around here. But then everybody else around there is like, golly, they don't know what the heck they're doing, <laughs> right? And, and so that's where there can be kind of some disruption because the amount of responsibility doesn't match the ability. But God has the ultimate ability. He has the power that enables him. He, you know, it's the simply the guy with the biggest gun wins, right? <laughs> the guy with the biggest muscles wins. You know, the guy with the biggest brain wins. God is the omnipotent, omniscient, ultra wise. He is the uh, most powerful being in the universe and nobody can stop him. Nobody can can question him. That does not make God responsible for everything that happens on planet Earth. That doesn't mean that everything that happens on planet Earth was his pre-planned program. Why? In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God says, Let us make man in our image and let them rule. Right. Dang, he put us in charge. So on the face of the planet... He put us in charge of what happens here. He gave us sovereignty over our decisions. He gave us responsibility. That does not mean that we have more power and more authority than God. It simply means that, you know, at the end of the day, he's not responsible for what we do. We're going to answer to him because he's sovereign, right? So Jesus never treated sickness and disease like it was part of God's plan or God's work. You know, he never, you know, people didn't travel for three days and go without food for three days to come to a hillside to listen to Jesus say, you know what, I just want to let you know that God is working that cancer for your good. Y'all just be blessed and go on home now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but how many times do we hear that in our churches? And so we have to be careful that we're, not doing things that are theologically accurate according to a single verse or a couple of verses. Jesus is the Word made flesh, right? So this, this God gave me kind of a funny illustration one time. Um, I was training a, a group of people, and I was at a house, and one of, the, one of the families had brought a young girl, and she had a clear tub of Lego pieces, and she had dumped them all over in one corner, and she was playing. And I had given the group, they were partnering up, and they were doing some activities, and I wasn't needed. Sometimes, you know, there's odd people, so, you know, I'm in there. But, nope, everybody had their partners. They're all settled. So I went to go play some Legos. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I looked at this huge pile of Legos and 
I saw uh, there was there was a piece that had two tires and a little connector in the middle, and there was another piece that was the same. And so I just got those two pieces out, and I put a little connector platform thing, and I built me up a little Batmobile-looking thing, and I rolled it to her and said, what do you think of that? She goes, that's not right. And she took it apart and threw, it, <laughs> threw all the pieces back in there. And I was like, well, wait a second. It, it, it looked pretty cool to me. See, and, I, and then I realized that for a lot of people, the Bible is just really confusing book. It's like a pile of Lego pieces. Bible verses are like Lego pieces. They're just kind of all thrown out there and they're all kind of in a jumble. And so people tend to look in the pile and, oh, that looks familiar to me. Oh, I heard that verse and my grandma and my pastor and when we were little and my denomination. So they pick a few things out that look familiar out of the pile and they put them together and then they create a doctrine. You know, it holds together. Look, it rolls. It looks pretty cool. Can't you see? The problem is we use the Bible that way. We pick some verses out. We take them out of the pile. We put them together and boom, we got a doctrine. We get a nice sermon and it looks, it's biblical, right? We got them from the Bible. We can get from the Quran or Book of Mormon or, you know, some New Age Hare Krishna Om sort of thing. You know, this is from the Bible. And then how do you know? And so what most people end up doing is they, they get in Lego Wars, you know, or smash cars, see which one holds together the most. But what you need to do is you need to compare it to the cover on the box, Right. That girl knew that that wasn't what those pieces were designed for because she had seen the cover on the box. She knew what all those pieces at the end of the day were supposed to look like. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Amen? So he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Did he not? And so our clearest view of the fullest revelation of God is in the Lord Jesus Christ Himself walking and talking among us. So that's really helpful for me because now Jesus becomes the lens through which we know the Father. Now this is important because it's not that God wasn't revealed up to that point. It's that He wasn't revealed in His fullness. In John chapter 1 it says that the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth has come to us in Jesus Christ. That no man has ever seen God, but the only begotten God who dwells in the bosom of the Father has manifested Him to us, right? Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, it says that God in times past spoke in many times, in many ways, in many portions to our fathers, right? So we have times and bits and pieces and portions to our fathers but in these last days he has spoken to us in the son he's come forth and revealed himself the word was made flesh the everything the word who was god what does that mean you know sometimes you have feelings but you can't put thoughts to it or you know you can't express it but then you then you find the words that match the the feelings right what does it happen is that you have something a reality that actually sometimes precedes the 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 crystallization this is what expresses that in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God. God knew Himself and there was a perfect revelation of all that He was. Amen? The crystallization. The, this perfectly expresses all that I am. And His name is the Son. Amen? The Father has a Son who perfectly represents and expresses everything that I am. When I express myself, it's Him. It turn, you know, when I communicate myself, it's Him. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen and beheld His glory, the only, the only begotten Son of God. Praise God. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So, you know, the creation reveals God as creator. The law reveals the, the moral standards and some of the, the sh uh, God cast his shadow, it says, you know, that the Old Testament was a, a shadow of the good things that are to come. But, you know, you would be pretty, you'd think I'm pretty weird if, you know, at lunchtime I showed you a, a picture of my family and said, you know, this is my wife and these are my daughters, this is my son. And you'd be like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then if I start talking to him, you know, I really love you, sweetie. I, I'm glad you're with him. you think, that dude is psycho.
You know, listen, there's a difference between shadows cast and the reality. The shadows remind you of, of the reality that's there and help you to see sometimes different aspects of that reality. But once the reality comes, you know what? I throw down the picture and I hug the wife, right? And so that's the cool thing about it is, listen, we don't throw our Old Testament away, but we're not bound to that because we interpret everything. We look at everything. That was a shadow of the good things that are to come in Jesus. In Him, we have the fullness. Listen, the Old Testament, Sabbath was a day. In the New Testament, Sabbath is the rest we find in Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, in the Old Testament, you had all these things that you couldn't eat and things that you could eat. In the New Testament, Jesus is our true nourishment. Amen? And so you just can't take anything into you spiritually and expect that it's going to nourish you. Jesus is what nourishes you. Amen? Uh, and so that's so, so important that we just get a, a clear picture and that we, that we, as we start our day off talking about healing, we want to lay a foundation for us to have a discussion because we all have experiences, right? But our experiences aren't truth. I prayed, and they didn't get healed. I know I believed. Right? Okay. Great. But let every man be a liar, and God be true. Amen? Uh, Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life is what Jesus said. And so our way to move forward is by sometimes we have to just say, you know what, maybe I have believed my experience and my own interpretation of life over and above God. And so maybe there's some things, well, I, ha I don't know how to make sense of that, but maybe I just need to forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. Keep my eyes fixed on Jesus so that I don't get mar knocked off the path. You know, I mean, there's, there's times where I'm going because I don't understand exactly what's going on. I remember one time I was in Cambodia and uh, there was a uh, a meeting that had been arranged and I shared a little bit and then I just asked if there's people that needed prayer and there was um, one, there was three young ladies there. All three of them had been born completely deaf and they were deaf mute um, and they had been prearranged to be there. And so I said, great, you know, and I prayed for the first girl and it was so exciting because she got her hearing instantly completely restored. She starts going, ah, 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 and she, but, and I was like, you know, speak to her in Cambodian, you know, and, and, you know, so, I was, and, but they said, she doesn't even know Cambodian, you know, so she's just making noise and excited. She can hear her, her own voice. She was, you know, ah, you know, ah, you know, she was just really, it was funny, you know, like a kid, you know, how they play with their voices when they're babies sometimes. And, uh, but she was signing, I can hear, I can hear, I hear myself, I hear you, you know, and, she, and so she had to go through the whole process of learning a language, apparently. So that was the first one. So, you know, of course, these other two, you know, you pray for the second one and the, and the second one gets uh, some, some improvement of hearing in one ear and the third one gets nothing. And I'm thinking, you know, what? You know, I, I, I wasn't believing differently in my own heart. Um, and so then the questions often come, well, why was this one healed, that one not, and, and the other, you know, this one partial and that one not complete, or that one nothing apparently. Um, and so as theologians and pastors and men of God, we have this tendency to want to give everybody biblical explanations for everything. And so when we don't know, we just pull together some verses and we make another Batmobile. <laughs> and we roll it out there. <laughs> and somebody needs to say, well, that ain't right. And <laughs> take it apart, throw it back in the pile because it doesn't look like the cover on the box. All I know is that that didn't look like what Jesus paid for. And so I've just decided it is above my pay grade a lot of times to figure out why people don't get healed. I don't know all the time why people don't get healed, but what I do know is why people do get healed. Why people do get healed is Jesus. Why people do get healed is through Jesus Christ and through faith in Him. That's what I know. Why does it happen some ways, this way, really quick, easy? Sometimes it takes a little bit more. Well, I don't know. Why is sometimes it really easy to walk in the Spirit? And some days, you just, you know, I can't drink enough cups of coffee to get in the Spirit. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm seeing some people like, that's terrible theology. <laughs> it is terrible theology. But you understand what I'm saying, okay? Um, I, don't, I don't always know those things. You know, why is it some days that it seems like it's really difficult and some days it feels like it's easy? I don't know. But I don't take the difficult days to say, okay, this is because God doesn't want me to walk with him today. If God wanted me to not sin, he'd have made it easy. We don't do that with holiness, do we? Because we know that if, some, if a Christian falls into sin, it's not because Jesus hasn't done enough or, or given them enough, that somehow God needs to open up his, we need to pry God's fingers loose so that somehow God would release to them what they need to be free from those addictions and from those character traits or those things. You know, actually that's been released at the cross and the resurrection. Amen. Or Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God was poured out. I mean, he didn't, he's not giving, you know, there's no temptation that's, that's overtaken us. We have the victory of Jesus, even if we're not walking in it. I mean, there's times what Romans says, don't you know that when Christ died, you died with him? You can't be subject to sin anymore, so don't walk in it anymore. Right? These, these guys were apparently, some of them were walking in ignorance of what they had, so therefore their life was affected by that. What if healing was the same way? What if healing was accomplished through Jesus Christ? What if by his stripes we were healed? What if that's really true? What if that just isn't something we should interpret away and spiritualize? You know? So what if God's nature really is that he loves to heal? That when people are brought to him, that Jesus never turned a person away. He never said, you know, I'm sorry, you're just like Job. I mean, I, it, 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 it's funny. I love Job, but we need to understand that Job came very, very early, even before the book of Moses. Uh, so this came very, very early in the revelation of God. And so God was basically proving one thing. No matter what Satan throws at somebody, that they, he can't win. He can't win. And God is the one who protects, and God is the one who blesses and restores, and Satan is the one who causes all the, the, the health problems. There's a thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. And even when Job doesn't have the benefits of our covenant, Satan still can't win. Amen? And the book of Job was in Jesus' Bible too, but he never went around saying, I'm sorry, you're just like Job. He didn't. God already proved that. He gave us that wisdom already, and now there's a fuller revelation. Job was looking forward for the day when his Redeemer would set his foot on the face of the planet, and this junk wasn't going to go on anymore. Amen? And his Redeemer has come. His name is Jesus. He set his foot on the planet, and he didn't go around saying, congratulations, you're just like Job. He said, congratulations, everything that Job waited for is here. The kingdom of God's at hand. Be free. Praise God. Praise God. Prophets and kings longed to live in the days that we're living in. Praise God. So, Praise the hope of glory. amen. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. I don't have a watch up here. How are we doing for bladders and stuff like that? <laughs> All right. Let me let me go maybe five more minutes, I think, because I, I want to touch on that just right here, because that was one that was what God used to get this over to me. Sometime after being back from Turkey, uh, you know, I had gone to seminary, been a missionary, and now I was a, a church planting pastor in Madison. And there came this point where uh, I had just done something, you know, bad that I knew I shouldn't have done. I mean, I probably vented at somebody or maybe, I turn, you know, watched something that I shouldn't have watched or something like that. You know, one of those things that, that happened. So you, you know, I was going to just go get things right with God. And I remember just praying, you know, God, the only reason I can even talk to you right now is because of the blood of Jesus, you know. And, uh, it's like the presence of God. You know, you, you don't base things on feelings, but sometimes God can do stuff that sort of helps you get things that, that you should have gotten already. It's just like the presence of God just went, you know. It was like, welcome home. 
You know, I was like, I didn't realize it, but I had just gotten so much into using Christian principles and biblical principles and trying to be a committed Christian. And, you know, I'm not going to be an uncommitted Christian. I'm going to be a really, so then I'm looking, you know, how do you do prayer life and how do you do evangelism? And how do you do, you know, how do you equip people and do ministry and all this kind of stuff? And, you know, and then, you know, the wheels fall off and then, and then I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed and enjoying being loved with a love I never deserved. But I can't lose because I, I didn't earn it. <laughs> it's a gift. And so I'm being loved by God through completely by the grace of Jesus Christ. I'm accepted. I was, I, you know, I was raised Catholic and all that went out of my system. I was prepared to feel really bad about myself for the next three days, you know. But God just said, forget that, you know. Yes, you got it right. You can talk to me because of the blood of my son. Whom here I am. And I just spent about an hour just being overwhelmed, just enjoying being loved, not needing to perform because my performance was just terrible. You know, and then so after about a uh, you know, an hour or so, I, you know, you start feeling like, okay, I got things I've got to do. Okay. And then you start, you know, I was like, okay, I was going to start deciding. I was okay, God, I'm going to be more committed and, you know, and start to turn the channel. Cause you know, at the end of the day, we got to hold our behavior together is the way I was thinking. And it was at that time. And it was really funny because I started to shift back to those patterns and I'm not saying that behavior doesn't matter. Behavior matters, but not in the way that we think it does. We base our relationship with God often on our walk with Him. If I were to say, tell me about your relationship with God, a lot of times people would start telling me about their walk. Well, I missed three quiet times this week, and gosh, you know, I've really been struggling with my attitude in this area, and could you pray for me about this? And, you know, all of a sudden, all this inadequacy, all this needs, all these sense of failures, you know, all these things that you feel like you need to improve. And I would be so bad to add healing to the list of all the things you suck at. <laughs> That's not the gospel. It's really not. So I started to shift the corner and go back down that road of being, you know, this ultra committed Christian. It's not that I'm not committed, but I found out what God wants me to be committed to. <laughs> and he just said, no, 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 well, just stay here. Stay in this place of enjoying being loved with a love you could never deserve. Amen. Don't say amen and start doing your own thing now and trying hard to start earning a love. Why don't you just stay in this place? And you know, Paul said that. He said, you know, I'm in labor again for you guys. I want Christ to be formed in you. And you look a few verses ahead of that in Galatians 4. He says, where is that sense of blessing that you had? You know, when I brought the gospel to you, it was good news. And you guys had this overwhelming sense of just being blessed with, just, you just don't deserve this, you know. You get to be sons of God, you know. Praise God. Christ has come to dwell inside of you. And I began to realize, you know what, that's how Christ operates. I knew Christ lived in me, but I didn't know. And he basically said, listen, let's don't rebuild that thing that just collapsed on the floor. Let's do this. All those things that you've been basing your relationship with me on, you know, all those things. Let, let's just set that aside. This is what I want to do. I want to give you, as a gift, I want to give you the relationship that Jesus has with me. I'm giving you His relationship as your relationship for you to enjoy. You don't have to have your own relationship with me. You get to have His. Yeah. So I began to realize before I was trying to learn all these principles so that I could build a relationship with God. I had Jesus as a bridge to get out of hell and into heaven. But then on the other side of that bridge, all I found was a bunch of principles of things that I needed to do improve. That's how it was kind of taught to me, you know. And so people get bored with Jesus because they never learned to live in Christ. They learn to receive heaven through Christ, but not how to live day by day. Because Jesus doesn't want to just bring us to heaven. He wants to bring us to the Father. He wants to bring us into a relationship, but not as a red-headed stepchild. Right? He doesn't bring us into the home as Cinderella. We're not adopted children like Cinderella. We're, ad we're adopted as sons. God says to you, the relationship that I have for all eternity with Jesus, I give to you. 
same standing, same grace, same favor. Because basically all he's doing is the relationship that had existed only to Jesus, now he just takes that same relationship and extends it to you. It's like Christmas tree lights, those old-timey ones, you know? Remember the ones that, that, you know, those big, long strip of lights? And if one of them goes dead, you have to figure out which one was the dead one because the way the circuit was ran, the electricity that would go into one would go out of that one and up to the line and go to the next one and up the line and up to the next one. Jesus is the first light in the string, guys. He's the first light in the string. And the very same spirit that he received, the very same relationship that he received, the, that that now through His death and resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit has now passed on into us. And so the Father and the Son are present inside of us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's awesome. So now it's really easy for electricity to shock people. All we have to do is to learn to let the electricity to come out, to let God be Himself. We just need to learn there's a couple switches. We just flip the switches and don't turn them off. Um, so one of the things that's really kind of fun is that I've learned if you just realize that God by nature is a healer and that you have him living in you, now it becomes less about theology and trying to figure stuff out and more about let's just believe. Let's just act on this. Let's just release this. Um, and so we were in Kenya um, last year I took a team there, and we went around and did uh, a lot of ministry, saw tons of instant miracles. Um, and then there was one, you know, including blind seeing, deaf hearing, that kind of thing. Uh, then there was one uh, team that wound up at a house that there was a man there that had been lame for the last two years. He had had uh, a severe uh, fever, and it had affected his spinal uh, spine, and he was lame and was not able to walk. He had palsy as a result of, of that whole thing. Um, and the doctors said, you know, you're going to be lame for the rest of your life. Well, they went and they ministered to him, and the guy said his testimony was that I can now do some things that I couldn't do before, and I have feeling returning into my body. And they had picked him up, you know, and well, let's just by faith, you know, take some steps, you know. And the guy never got to the point where he could stand or walk. So the next day, you know, they told us about this, and they're like, hey, come on. And, you know, so we took the whole team back there the next day, and so we prayed for him. And he said, no, this is even better from the last day, you know. And he was getting to the point he couldn't quite stand on his own, but he was getting some strength. And so what do you do then? Do you just say, well, you know, I wonder why this doesn't work, or I wonder, you know, why God's not doing this, or, or maybe it's just not his time. See, all those things are things that we tend to do, but Jesus never did. Now, just because he wasn't healed completely instantly, that's just what, that's what Jesus looks like, right? But hey, Jesus was also the best teacher in the face of the planet, best evangelist in the face of the planet. You're going to say the gift of evangelism isn't real just because people aren't falling into the boat like, like they did for Jesus? Right? Or there's no, this isn't a real gift of teaching because he can't teach as good as Jesus? Well, how about we're being built up into his image? We're still growing up into him amen and so we uh what did we do well we taught this young man how he can minister healing and receive healing for his for himself because he was born again um and so uh we taught him that listen god doesn't just want to, uh that salvation power to work in your heart that salvation power that works in your heart also will work in your body and this is how to release it in your body. So, you know, what we've been doing to you, you can do that for yourself. And so we taught him that. So we took up a collection and we bought him some crutches so that he could continue to stand up because he, he had an elderly father. It was him and an elderly father. Uh, and so he had some crutches now uh, that he could speak into life into his legs and, and hold himself up with his upper body and begin to take steps. Uh, I just got a, uh, a picture and a testimony from the pastor. This guy is walking around totally free, totally healed, walking to church, you know, got a picture of this guy standing upright and stuff like that. Well, why didn't it happen instantly? You know, I'll let you figure that out, Mr. Theologian. I don't know. <laughs> but it happened. Praise God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Why? Because sometimes faith and perseverance go together. But we don't persevere well if our minds are all full of questions. 
and doubts and thinking, well, maybe God's not really for my healing right now. Maybe God's not for their healing right now. Maybe, maybe they've been a stinker. And you know you've been a stinker. Amen? <laughs> and so, listen, what if healing were by grace? Psalm 103, verse 3, right? He forgives all of our iniquity and heals all our diseases. You can't go around just forgiving people everything. God can through Christ, and He can heal them through Christ. Why? Because on the cross, He bore our sins. At the whipping post, He bore our sickness and diseases. Praise God. He did that, and He can do that. So that means I don't have to go around doing background checks. When people need, need healing, you know, I don't have to say, well, let's see, tell me, you know, have you been involved in this and this and this? And, you know, your dad was a 32nd degree Mason. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. You're screwed. You know, <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Listen, Jesus at the cross absolutely solved all of that issue. So I don't have to know your problem. I just get to know the solution. Because the solution to all your problems, no matter what they are, is the finished work of the cross. Isn't that good? Yes. So that makes things simple. Now you can start ministering like Jesus and the apostles. Silver and gold have I none. But what I have, let me see if I can give it to you. Have you been a good boy? Have your dad been, you know, we need to break this off and break that off and, and smash that thing and you need to renounce this and repent of that. And Let's see. Let me see now if I can give it to you. No, I get just to give it to you. What I have, I can give. Isn't that good news? You don't have to go around doing background checks to see if people deserve to be in the conditions they are. <laughs> Praise God that He's good and that it works by grace. So, Father, I thank You for my brothers and sisters. I thank You, God, for the amazing work that You're doing in their lives. And, God, we just ask right now that where people have come in burdened, uh, full of confusion, full of question, full of sickness, full of disease, that You break all that off. I thank You right now. We just say thank You that we are forgiven of all of our iniquity, and that you heal us of all our diseases. In Jesus' name.